Hey, Tommy, I can't wait for uh, this week's show because what are we talking about? We are talking about the top five soft rotors that aren't Subarus. Yep, in this episode, we're going to be going through all of the vehicles that we've taken off-road that aren't, let's say, Wranglers or trucks or, you know, the stuff that has a low-speed transfer case, but the stuff that people buy uh, to take to work. Uh, and, more importantly, we're going to be talking about the brand new 2020 Subaru Outback because we put it through a battery of tests. That's right. We had the Outback here at the offices for a few days. We had the opportunity to take it out into the wilderness. We drove it around on the streets and we got to live with Subaru's latest and greatest in lifted <laughs> crossover wagon things. And that's coming up right now on Talking. That's with an N. Cars. Sit back and relax or keep driving if you're driving. TFL Talking Cars is on the air, the world's most popular car podcast. Okay, maybe not yet, but we're working on it. All right, we're back, Tommy. So, um, what do you think of the new Outback? And full disclosure, guys, Subaru unfortunately does not loan us cars, so we actually had to borrow uh, this Subaru from a very lovely lady in Denver who put it on Turo. The vehicle was brand new. It was a premium edition, uh, and it was the 2020 model. Uh, so you kind of got to take it off-road and compare it uh, to a 1978 Subaru DL. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, Andre was driving the new 2020 model. I was driving the grandfather of the <laughs> new Outback, and we had a steep, rutted-out hill. And basically, we, we just wanted to find out, has 42 years of technology and improvements actually made the Subaru better at what their marketing claims? And what their marketing claims is that this vehicle is ready to tackle your active lifestyle. And here's what I'm talking about. I'm right here on the uh, Subaru.com website yep. looking at the new 2020 Outback. And if we look at the photo gallery, just about every exterior picture is of the Subaru doing something off-road, right? The main cover photo is it out in some ruts. You've got this one of it going up some uh, hills and some berms. There's this one crawling up a, a rocky forest road with the mountain bikes on the roof. It, there's a few of them on road with kayaks on the roof and stuff, but just about every image is the Subaru going out into something rugged. So before we talk about what happened when we took the new 2020 Outback off-road and how it compared to the grandfather, right, the the old DL, uh, let's talk about uh, just how much it has changed or hasn't changed. And by the way, if you're looking for Subaru videos, and specifically that one, visit one of our channels, TFL Car, TFL Off-Road. I think that's where we'll end up uh, putting this um, old versus new video to see actually what happens, or just keep listening when we describe what happens. But let's talk about the 2019 to the 2020. Now, um, my first impression, Tommy, and keep in mind we did own the previous generation um, because we did want to give it a long-term review, is that uh, if you put the two next to each other, you'd have a hard time telling them apart. The 20, you know, the, the, the fifth generation, which is a previous one compared to the current one. And by the way, um, I think we probably should talk about how much it costs. Starting price for the new Outback is about 26 thousand six hundred and forty five and how much was the one that we tested it was about thirty thousand dollars okay yep. mm -hmm. and then year to date so far subaru has sold about seventy four thousand four hundred and sixty seven wow that's not about that's exact uh, number of outbacks <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> so what do you think in terms of styling when you compare the you know fifth gen to the sixth gen it's very similar. Yeah. Um, the fifth gen, I've got the Wikipedia page pulled up right here if you're watching on uh, online so you can see what it looks like. But the, the fifth gen came out in 2015. Yep. The one we owned was a 2018 model. And there were a little bit of differences between 15 and 18. But overall, <laughs> the 18 we owned and the all-new 2020 are pretty much the same on the outside. Like you said, the grille is almost the same. The lower front fascia is almost the same. The roof rail system, the integrated roof rail, is the same. The taillights are a little bit different, but if you're not specifically looking for these minute changes, it's hard to tell the fifth generation from the sixth. You know what the easiest way to tell apart? The what? Square fog lamps on the sixth gen versus on the fifth gen. Yeah, so the new one's got these like little <laughs> Square, slits, yeah. <laughs> these little slits of fog lamps. But uh, as a non-car person, if you're just walking down the streets, you'd you'd be hard pressed to tell that this was a ground up redesign. Yeah, and um, you know every uh, Subaru Outback has 8.7 inches of ground clearance, uh, and really Subaru has done something really cunning. I'm gonna, 
or clever, either way, uh, and that is they've convinced people that the Outback is a tall station wagon uh, when it, in fact, is a pretty much a full-on crossover. Yes, at one point, it was a more aggressive legacy wagon. Yeah. Well, you know, slightly more cladding. Right. But nowadays, it it's you're a thousand percent right. This is a full-on... I'm like pretty much an SUV. The thing is massive. Yeah, it's, it's big. huge. Yeah, and that's you know that's good because it's got a lot of room on the inside. Uh, the new one, of course, uh, uh, especially when you fold those rear seats down, you could put you and our new dog Blaze. That's um, Bernie's mountain dog in there quite comfortably and have room for you know two of your friends. That's how much room is back there. So there is just tremendous amount of utility in the Outback. Now, like I was saying on the website, as you can see, pretty much every bit of marketing. Is, is showing the aggressiveness of the Subaru and how it can take you, you know, on the roads less traveled is, yes. is what they're going for. But the, 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 the pickle that Subaru has been in recently is that they have transitioned their philosophy to uh, fuel savings through the continuously variable transmission. Yeah. And that's always been one of the sticking points with, uh, I have with the new Subarus is that they have the clearance, they have the looks, they have the value, but they don't... I just don't personally think they can actually meet the marketing that they're putting out there when it comes to off-road capability. Yeah, so, uh, you know, let, let me put this into perspective for you, at least in my opinion. There are basically four kinds of transmissions that modern cars have, uh, and I'll, I'll go down the road in terms of what I think is most to least off-road worthy, okay? So most, by far, I think is an automatic transmission with a torque converter. If you were to get the, a Jeep, I would actually recommend you getting that over a manual. Uh, next, I would say a manual. Uh, and You can drive a manual off-road. It just means it's a little bit more work. You have to slip the clutch a little bit more. It works fine, but the automatic is just easier. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time off-road, and I've spent a lot of time either in our old manual Wrangler or our new automatic Gladiator, and I would much rather take the automatic Gladiator. I don't have to work as hard, uh, and I don't have to slip the clutch. Then below that is uh, a dual clutch. Uh, I don't think dual clutches work really well off-road. Uh, they, they tend to kind of hunt and pick and uh, basically get overwhelmed when uh, you lose traction. We've just uh, recently reviewed the new GLA, which had a dual clutch up uh, Tombstone Hill. That video will be publishing this week. So if you want to see how a dual clutch does off-road, that's a good one. And by far, uh, the worst in a car, at least, is the CVT. Um, And I think that has to do with the fact that um, the CVT tends to want to protect the belt that's running around the CVT. And so what will happen is when you floor it and you get in a situation where there's no traction, uh, it'll actually cut power to the wheels, whereas like a regular transmission will keep those wheels spinning until the car digs itself into the ground. And it might be a belt. It might be a chain, depending on the application. Yeah, 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 but they work sure. pretty much the same. Which is ironic because they work really well in uh, um, side-by-sides. Yeah, because they weigh nothing. But the, the point is that, obviously, we know this is not going to be Wrangler off-road. We're not expecting it to compete with the Forerunner out on the trails. We're not expecting it to compete with a uh, even like a Grand Cherokee Trailhawk. But if they are marketing it as a off roady crossover, the CVT does let it down. And, and let me give you an example. Up the Tombstone Trail, yep. I recently had the opportunity to take the new... 2021 Chevrolet Trailblazer on the same exact path. I tried to take the same exact line. And the Trailblazer is by no means an off-roader. It's a tiny little... uh, It's a Korean-built hatchback, basically, with a three-cylinder turbo. And in my opinion, that Trailblazer performed better off-road than the Outback because it had a conventional torque converter and a nine-speed automatic. Even though the Trailblazer is by no means, <laughs> the new one, considered a proper 4x4, it still, in my opinion, will go further than the latest CVT-equipped Subarus. And, Tommy, you're being modest. Let's face it. Tommy has been doing a lot of our off-road testing, and uh, we not only do real-world testing like Tombstone Hill and before that, obviously, Gold Mine Hill, where we actually put the cars into a real-world situation and see how it performs on the same hill, uh, you know, basically comparing car versus car versus car. But you also do a really cool slip test where you put it on rollers, Mm. right, and we find out what happens more in a scientific sort of controlled environment, right, where it's not as, um, well, it's not as changeable as the outside. Now, we should say, Mm -hmm. when we get to the list of the top five soft rotors, there is a one car on that list with a CVT, and it's the only car we've ever driven that performs well with a CVT off-road. Yeah, it's weird, huh? It's weird. I don't know what they did to this car, but it it actually works. Now, I will say, in my opinion, we had the we took a 2015 Subaru, the fifth gen, and a 2020 up the same hill. Yep. Two different days. Yep. 
the the 2020 did better than the 15 in my opinion. So the the programming on the transmission and the engine combo is better on the new model. It, it provides more torque down low. Double X mode when you need it. <laughs> Double secret triple X mode. Well, the one we had was the uh, the the model we rented off Turo from Claire. By the yeah. way, Claire let us take her car off. Yeah. we asked permission. Um, the the model we tested was a uh, uh, a premium, 2.5 liter premium trim. So it had the smaller engine. It didn't have the turbo. And it also had the single X mode. For 2020, there is a new model available called the Onyx XT, which is a 2.4 liter turbo, 260 some horsepower. That one has a double X mode. That's why I said double is, secret X mode. Which is their off-road <laughs> mode, yeah. And that is also available, believe it or not, with a engine skid plate and a differential skid plate. Now you're probably wondering, why didn't we take that one off-road? Because Subaru doesn't work with us. We and it wasn't on Turo. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't on, wasn't on the table. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I think um, it's very valuable over the years to be able to compare how the cars – uh, have changed uh, using software, right? And so, you know, just as background, you guys be make, I'm kind of being lighthearted, but you know, X mode is basically a terrain management system, uh, and the way that the terrain management systems work is um, they use the car's ABS to determine which wheel has traction and which wheel doesn't have traction, and then they break the wheel that has traction that doesn't have traction, and that sends power to the wheel that does have traction, right? So imagine a vehicle with two wheels, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see my hands, and one wheel is in the air and one wheel is on the ground. Uh, And so X mode or any of the train managements will sense that the one on the ground is spinning, which is obviously not moving you anywhere. It'll break that one, and that automatically shifts power to the one uh, that has traction or is on the ground. The problem with, like I said, with CVTs is uh, that in an automatic that wheel will keep spinning and spinning and spinning until the thing digs itself into the ground. But with the CVT, we found, especially with Subarus, it will cut power uh, to the wheel that has traction because it's afraid of burning out the CV, the, 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 the belt uh, on the cone that is a CVT transmission. Uh, and so, and you know, let's, let's say you're going off-road to your cabin or you're driving in the snow or you're driving in the rain. Under all those circumstances, it works great, mm-hmm. right? No, oh, that's fine. But... If you're doing serious off-roading. Yeah, and uh, quite honestly, the, 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 the off-roading we do is harder than 99% of people yeah, exactly. will actually. So we, we do it just to push it. But like you said, in everyday driving, the CBT is just fine. And let's talk about what the Outback's like in everyday driving. Yeah. Because it's our first comfy. Ex- experience. In, very comfy. Cause super, super soft ride. Almost um, almost uh, almost like uh, old school soft. Yeah, like American old school <laughs> yeah. soft. It was good to see you. Yeah, we had high, big uh, sidewalls. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't in any ways um, you know, overwrought when you're on the road. Uh we had the small engine, like we said, the naturally aspirated engine. It's pretty slow. Which suffers up here at a mile above sea level. I think it's only 182 horsepower. It's a boxer engine, so, you know, the pistons go sideways, and it sits low in the car, which gives you a better center of gravity. That's all good. It is all good, yeah. And it's uh, the, the interior is really pretty cool now, so they pretty much eliminated all the buttons throughout the interior. Yeah, think of it like a baby Tesla screen in the middle, right? They've gone with this massive screen, which now, uh, of course, does a lot of the uh, main controls for the vehicle. Uh, And it actually gives you some pretty cool off-road pages, too. So I think it gives you an inclinometer, right, to show you how much the car is inclined. Um, And, you know, it's much more modern on the interior. Having said that, uh, it's still pretty boring. I mean, it's very utilitarian. There's not a lot of, like, pizzazz or styling outside of this big screen in the middle of the car. Now, the base screen is a dual 7-inch multimedia system. Yep. But we had the Starlink 11.6-inch multimedia system in our premium. And, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's a little slow. so It works like an iPhone, right? It's yeah. got big icons. Luckily, it has some uh, hard button controls. So dual zone automatic climate control, you've got traditional buttons up and down, which was nice. But for the most part, everything is controlled in the center screen. But once you get past that, you're right. The rest of the interior is pretty bland. It's it's very, I would say, rugged, but it's not something that you think is very premium. Yeah, it's you know it's utilitarian. So it feels right if you've got a big furry dog and you want to throw him in the back. You don't necessarily feel bad about it because there's nothing that he's going to be or she's going to be tearing apart that that can't be torn apart. You know what I mean? It's mm. just it's just very kind of. You know, just useful, useful, I guess, is a good word. Uh, and uh, 
How about uh, power? Do you think it had enough power? Yeah, it was fine. It was slow, but yeah. it's got enough for what it needs to do. Yeah, I mean, it's a good car. I think if if you have the previous generation Outback, there is no reason to upgrade to the new one. I just they don't see the value in in you know taking the depreciation hit on yours. But if you are looking at getting into an Outback for the first time out of another vehicle, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's yeah. It's good value. It's a ton of space. It's got, it's got plenty of capability for the snow. Yeah. Symmetrical all-wheel drive is, is a very functional system in the snow. And it's, it's decently efficient, too, for the size of the vehicle. I think we were averaging low to mid-20s pretty consistently, which yeah. is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it does okay. Um, and the only, like I say, the only critique I would have of it that, that would be, you know, Something I, that would keep me from buying it is, especially up here at altitude, uh, you know, boxer engines don't have a lot of torque to begin with, uh, and this thing is pretty, uh, well, well, pretty, pretty sluggish. Luckily, there is the yeah. turbo if you wanted something a little quicker. All right, let's say you want something a little, a little bit faster. Let's go down our list of uh, top five soft rotors that we've tested, uh, and these are in various categories. Uh, th- there's no like price points. Uh, they're just kind of you know the ones out of the kind of the, the, the mid-size-ish crossover slash segment that we think are the best. Well, we should also explain too that when we say soft rotor, we don't mean Wranglers. Yeah, Wranglers. So, or so these Broncos. are these are vehicles that don't are have a low speed transfer case. These are vehicles that are going to be primarily used on road. Yep. Um, but they're also vehicles that are not compromised by some of the challenges of an off road vehicle. So they're not compromised by poor steering like you'd find in a Wrangler or a rough ride like you might find in a. Uh, in a uh, a different Wrangler, <laughs> so the point is that they're they're comfortable normal driving cars, but they can also tackle the, the the forest roads if you want to go camping or if you want to go explore. And the first car on our list is not a mid sized crossover. It's a little bit bigger. It's quite a bit bigger. It's also quite a bit more expensive, but it is an interesting vehicle. It's the new Mercedes Benz GLE. Yeah, it starts at fifty four thousand dollars. Year to date sales are twenty one thousand, uh, and it's really um, kind of in the sweet segment of Mercedes. Uh, uh, crossovers, right? So it starts, the GL means it's the crossover. So it goes GLA, which we just tested. Uh, and actually took up Tombstone. So, you know, check out that video. GLB, which actually I love. The GLB is actually a, a three row small crossover, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, then there's the GLC, which is a mid size one. The GLE, which is kind of the next one up. And then, of course, the GLS being the big, massive, massive one that we just had uh, with the AMG 63 package that we actually drag raced. So let's provide some context for the GLE because it's kind of an interesting story. Yeah. When the German auto manufacturers started pumping out their first line of SUVs in the early 2000s, they all kind of targeted the same thing, which was a lot of ruggedness and capability. So if you look at like the Volkswagen Touareg, you know, low range locking diffs. Porsche Cayenne, the first generation, low range locking diffs. First generation ML, low range body on frame. And the ML became the GL. So yeah, the GLE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so basically what happened was uh, they all launched with this pretty impressive off-road tech. And then somewhere along the line, they realized that nobody at all was using it or cared about it. And then that all went away in the mid-2000s. So then the, the, the Cayenne lost the low range. The ML here in the U.S. lost the low range and became unibody. Uh, X5 was always pretty much on-road. Yeah, so it was a sport with. utility vehicle. Yep, Touareg lost the low range and became much more comfortable. And then throughout the mid-2000s and even the 2010s, that pretty much continued. They kept evolving and made a more comfortable on-road. But for this year... Because I think they're realizing that this this marketing concept of having the, the ability to go take you to the cool climbing spots and camping spots has become such an important thing to people, for 2020, they've added a lot of this tech back into the vehicles. So the GLE has that crazy hopping suspension, right? That crazy uh, yeah, let me explain. <laughs> suspension that will get you unstuck. It, it Literally, it has a hopping mode. Yeah, let me explain. So th- this hopping mode... Uh, is basically a way to get you unstuck out of soft sand, right? Mm-hmm. So it'll it'll actually bounce itself up and down. So if you're buried in soft sand, it'll bounce itself out. Uh, and there's some videos of Mercedes actually proving that. Uh, and I would say it's, um, yeah, I would say it's the second most off-road capable uh, SUV in Mercedes, a crossover in Mercedes lineup. Well, the G is, of course, the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the G wagon is obviously head and shoulders. But a lot of the stuff in the G has kind of, and, and the stuff that Mercedes has learned from the uh, G wagon has made its way into the GLE. And this is the one that, by far, uh, I would be more most more likely to take off road out of all the Mercedes outside of, of course, the G wagon. The, the funny thing too is even this vehicle's main competitor, the GLE, the X5. Yeah. 
now has an off-road package as yes. well with the locking for differential. And let's talk about that. There actually is an off-road mode now in Mercedes MBUX, right, which is their, their electronic uh, infotainment system. Uh, I think there's a trail mode. There's like an off-road mode, right? Yep. Um, so uh, they have actually tuned their traction control system uh, to work in uh, off-road situations. It's not as good as having a low range uh, or a locking div, but it does really well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing what they can do, and the air suspension is super capable on the new GLEs. Yeah, and so you get more ground clearance, of course, a lot more, if I remember. I took it, uh, I went on the program, uh, and I just recall being really uh, amazed at how much tech they threw at the GLE, uh, and how much of it was aimed at actually going off-road. Yeah, so next on our list is that CVT-equipped vehicle we were talking about, but but which is super surprising in its capability, partly because it's somewhat light. That's the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. Yeah, it starts at 24.59 uh, for the 1.5 uh, turbo uh, with the all-wheel... Um, S-A-W-C, super... All-wheel control. Ooh, I think that's right, yeah. yeah. super all-wheel control. Uh, your day sales are like 6,000. It's actually a vehicle you'll see in a lot of rental fleets. And I'm not surprised. You know, Mitsubishi has a very long background in off-roading that they kind of walked away from, right? When you think about the early Dakars... Right, the Pajero. Yep. These were mm-hmm. all Mitsubishi. So Mitsubishi, at one point in time, uh, when they were building some of the very earliest uh, SUVs and crossovers, uh, and of course um, the Evo, Evos, right, the Evolution, they had uh, some of the most advanced uh, off-road engineering um, in the business. Uh, and then uh, they had some Mitsubishi had some issues with. Um, well, corruption, let's be honest about it. And they basically took apart that whole engineering team. Uh, and since then, they've been really struggling to, to gain that off-road expertise back as a company. Uh, but now, uh, with the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross, it's actually really good off-road. We've taken it up Goldmine Hill, uh, and it did surprisingly well, even though it has a CVT. So you can tell you can actually tune a CVT for off-roading if that's what you choose to do, and not for fuel efficiency. Yeah, the, the rest of the car is kind of crummy, if I'm being honest. <laughs> the, the interior isn't very good. It's well, not not very good to look at. It's not great to drive on the road. Well, when you shut the door, there's certainly no vault-like Yeah, clang. it's not brilliant. But the interesting thing is, is that you would never expect it to go the places where it will go, partly because I think it's quite light and quite small. So well, the enemy of off-roading is, is weight. Yep. And the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross is a surprisingly light vehicle. It also has good, fairly good overhangs for a crossover. And with that little turbo, they, they have managed to make the super all-wheel control work in a lot of impressive situations. In situations the car should probably not be going into, it will handle it pretty decently. Doesn't it have like a like a full fake center lock or two that you can press down if I remember A right. lot of the Mitsubishis do, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's right. I think it's like a PTO system, a power takeoff system. Yeah. But for, you know, starts at 22.9 for the front wheel drive. An all wheel drive starts right around 25,000. Yep. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a, not a, you know, like I said, not a brilliant car to drive on road. Well, it's, it's like when you compare that Subaru Outback to the old DL, right? Even though the DL doesn't have a low speed transfer case, it's it, so light. It yeah, just scampered it up better. the hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just, and that's kind of like the Mitsubishi. All right, and the next vehicle on our list is not all that light, but it is very capable, and that, of course, has to be the Jeep uh, Cherokee. Yep. Now, we know the Wrangler is a whole different animal, so we're not going to talk about the Wrangler, but this is uh, a vehicle that comes in many trim levels, uh, of course, the top of which is the Trailhawk, uh, which has uh, a low-speed transfer case. Yeah, this is kind of the outlier on our list because this is genuinely a very capable vehicle in Trailhawk form. Uh, the, the Cherokee is competes with RAV4 and competes with uh, Pilot or not Pilot uh, CRV. Yep. But it really is an interesting vehicle with capability wise. It's got real underbody protection. It has real rock rails, uh, which are available. It has um, you know like a low range. The a benefit of a low range is basically you can multiply the wheel torque. Yeah. So when you point most of these crossovers uphill and give them gas, they just kind of sit there and whine and eventually start making their way up. Where in the Cherokee, you put that thing in low range, select one of the off road programs, it'll just crawl its way up effortlessly. A lot like a like a Wrangler or its bigger brother, the Grand Cherokee. Yeah. And I don't want to get into the deep dive into like the different uh, Jeep, all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, you know, Quadra, 
different blah 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 but uh, it does work off-road right so they do have different all-wheel drive systems depending on which one you get and if you go for like i said the trailhawk with the real recovery hooks uh ground clearance it it has been rubicon rated right which means it should be able to do the rubicon at least that's what jeep says no it's been trail rated trail rated which is very it's very confusing because now they have a rubicon rating so i'm sorry i misspoke it's trail rated it's not rubicon rated yeah so trail rating is like they have these standards for ground clearance approach angle water fording um and and they they put the trail rated on many vehicles like the compass is rubicon rated the rubicon yeah Yeah. so if it's got a rubicon sticker on the side it has to go down the rubicon if it's got a trail rated sticker on the side just kind of like, like it's eight years ago, I did a video on this, and it's basically you know it has to be able to afford enough water. Yeah, to get it's got to have yeah. enough ground clearance. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So it is trail rated, uh, and it is uh, you know it is uh, out of all these, it's the one I would certainly take if I was going to go do some serious off roading. And when we mean serious off roading, we're talking about like um, you know a steep hill with uh, very loose materials with r- pointy rocks. Uh, or mud bogging or anything where, you know, the vehicle can get stuck and you need to be able to, A, extract it somehow, or B, uh, if it does go someplace, you're putting it in danger and hopefully there's underbody protection that will protect it. And that's that's the only one on this entire list, really, uh, that I would feel comfortable with. Yeah, but the difference is, is that the Trailhawk will go... Way farther than anything, than anything else. Yeah. I mean, the Jeep guys took these things up. Hell, uh, Hell's Gate, yeah. Hell's Revenge in Moab, which is a super serious trail. So these are very, very capable. It's definitely the most capable on the list. All right, what's number two, Tommy? Number two is another surprise. That's the Honda Passport. Um, and the Honda Passport is a super interesting kind of out of left field vehicle. Basically, they took the Pilot yep. and they chopped the butt off. Yep. And they made the Honda Passport. But what the Honda Passport? And they raised it. They they did. What the Honda Passport has is a really good all-wheel drive system. It's called the IVTM system. They use it in vehicles like the Ridgeline as well. Yeah, it's got different modes specific to what kind of off-roading you're doing. So there's a sand mode. Uh, there's a, you know, a rut. There's a snow mode. There's kind of a rock and ruts mode. Yep, exactly. And... In this vehicle, the mode systems really have a big impact on changing the vehicle's dynamics. It also is a very powerful engine. Yeah. So it's got a strong six-cylinder engine with a lot of lower end torque, which will get you through places that you wouldn't believe. So unlike most of these, which are kind of four-cylinders, except for the Mercedes. Well, the four- Mercedes is a four-cylinder too, but that, that'll like struggle to really move out of its own way. When equipped, you know, the, 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 the Passport equipped with the V6 goes like heck, Pretty good ground clearance as well, but it's just a four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive programming which sets this thing apart. It really is good. The Sport starts at 33900 They've sold about 19314 today. By the way, we didn't talk about the Jeep numbers. That starts at 27585 and year-to-date they've sold 56000 So it's about two-to-one when it comes to sales, actually more than two-to-one, uh, Honda Passport to Jeep Cherokee. But, yeah, you know, I, I always tend to judge how serious manufacturers are about – uh, their vehicles going off road by where they launched this vehicle, right? Because we go on these press launches, or at least we used to before COVID. Uh, and guess where they launched the passport? It was Moab. Yep, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so if you know if you've got enough confidence in your vehicle to to let a bunch of journalists go uh, bashing it around Moab, uh, let's face it, we didn't do anything. I sure didn't go on that. But uh, who did that? That was Steve, right? Steve. Yep. Yeah. They 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 didn't uh, necessarily go up Hell's Gate or Hell's Revenge or even Fins and things, but they did uh, you know do some. Relatively interesting kind of moab off-roading, and whenever you have enough confidence to take your vehicle and let uh, it potentially get in damage um, in Moab, then, you know, that says about what you think and what you've done to engineer it. I don't, so Honda says it competes with vehicles like the Grand Cherokee, yeah. the Foreigner, and the Highlander. It's kind of a weird slot. It's bigger than the CRV, but it's smaller than the than the Pilot. And actually, I'm, I'm glad you came up with the 400. That's another one that's not on this list because of obviously. Well, that's that's, a, that's an extreme off roader. Right, that, that's, that's, that's a whole other league. That's like the Wrangler. Low range. Uh, same thing with the Grand Cherokee, right? Yeah, there's actually a guy on YouTube who takes these pilots. He's got a lifted one. Yeah. Or sorry, he takes a passport. He's got a lifted passport. Yeah. And takes it everywhere. I saw that. Yeah. yeah he puts it through some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And didn't he build some like his own like. Uh, uh, skid plates for it. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's got bumpers. He's got skid plates. Yeah, it's pretty cool where he takes it. So and even a trailer, right? I don't know if he has a trailer. Mm. Yep. All so, right. And number one, number one on this list is kind of one I somewhat agree with. 
It's the RAV4. Now, there are various, once again, trims, right? There's everything from uh, a hybrid to the Prime, and then we're talking about, you know, the either the TRD or we're talking about the Adventure. Yeah, and the Adventure is the one to get, by the yeah, way. Yeah, for sure. Because the TRD is stupid expensive, and it basically... Gets you better tires. It gets you better tires and wheels, yeah. But, <laughs> but functionality-wise, it's almost the same as the Adventure. So definitely get the Adventure if you want one. Um, I, I, I appreciate what they're going for with the RAV4 off-road trims. Uh, I took a TRD off-road pretty deep into the woods, and it did okay... But with the TRD badge on it, you really expect it to go further and do more things than it really you can do. You expect like a Tacoma or a Tundra? No, or not that a... much, but like more than – I mean I'd expect it to have a real skid plate on it. And I, I just didn't feel like it had any protection underneath. Well, well, so you know, there are two kinds of off-road packages, right? There are appearance packages and then there are like you know, actual off-road packages which help you going off-road. And uh, I think the adventure is a little bit of both. Right, so you do get some of the off-road goodies, like the be- better ground clearance. I think there are some skid plates in the Adventure, if I recall right. Right, you, you get the black and hood if you want to like have not a lot of sun in your eyes. That's the thing the Jeep does too. By the way, it starts at about twenty-seven thousand for the LE all-wheel drive, uh, and this number is pretty staggering. Year-to-date sales twenty. 20- 219,683. I think it's their best selling vehicle now. It outsells the Camry. Yeah, it's a really, really a good car. It, I mean, I appreciate it's on this list and it, it does pretty, it does better than a lot of his competition. So it's better off road than the Escape. Well, let me ask you this, Tommy. Um, it does directly compete with the Outback. Yeah. Right? Certainly price wise. Which would you get? I'd probably get the Outback. Really? I really like the size of the Outback. You think yeah. it's got a little more room? Yeah, and I like the interior too. I mean, the RAV4 is a very nice interior, but I like the Outback. Even if you were going off roading? Mm, they're both not, not great. Um, right, on this list, which, which, which one would you get if you wanted to go, you know? Oh, the Cherokee. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's going to take you the so, so, you know, so, so I dirt bike, right? Yep. Uh, and I like riding dual sports, which are motorcycles that, um, you know, are used for both on road and off road. Uh, and the way that you measure a, a, a dual sport is you kind of talk about what percentage it is on road and what percentage it is off road, right? Yeah. So let me give you like a classic example would be like a Kawasaki KLR, right? That's a bike that that's got knobby tires, but most people ride it on road. So that might be something like let's say fifty five percent on road, forty five percent off road, something like that. Okay. And you can apply that same kind of standard to these vehicles. So Subaru, what percentage is it on road versus off road? I would say eighty percent on road, twenty percent off road. How about the Mercedes? I would say eighty five percent on road. Uh, Not the way people use it. It's capability. If oh seventy five percent on road, twenty five percent off road. Okay, Mitsubishi. Um, I agree with you so far. Seventy percent on road, thirty percent off road. How about the Cherokee? Uh, Sixty-five, sixty percent on road, forty percent off road. Uh, Trackhawk Cherokee, fifty-fifty. I would say. Uh, tra- tra- trailhawk? trailhawk, not Trackhawk. Yeah, uh, trackhawk would be hundred percent on road. Uh, yeah, Trackhawk <laughs> is probably uh, Trailhawk is probably fifty-fifty. All right, Honda Passport. Um, sixty on road, forty off road. I go 70 on road. I think it's not that good. How about the Toyota RAV4? Uh, let's go with two. The RAV, just a regular RAV4. Oh, um, 90% on road, 10% okay. off road. Uh, an adventure. 80% on road, 20% off road. Oh, there you go. So uh, now, depending on how you guys are going to use uh, your mid size crossover, <laughs> you know uh, which one to buy. So we should also do a quick blast of some other interesting ones. Yeah, that sure. I, I really like Trailblazer with the active trim, uh-huh. real skid plate, real off road. Yeah, you just tested that. Uh, check out TFL Off Road. There's a really great review of it. Love that little thing. It's super good off road. Yeah. Surprisingly good off road. Other good off roaders um, the Palisade Telluride. Surprisingly capable. Center locking diff. Yep. Uh, it's pretty good, actually. Yeah, I took it I took it through Moab. Uh, you know, the, the twins, the Palisade and the Telluride. They're both actually not bad off-road. Uh, and, yeah, I, you know, I don't think anybody will take them off-road. But if you had to, you could. On the big end of the spectrum. Uh, Explorer? T- no. No. Tahoe Z71. Pretty good off-road. Pretty good off-road, yeah. It's it's better than it used to be. Certainly Grand Cherokee can be awesome off-road. Yeah, that's probably the best of the big ones. Yep, really good off-road. Um, what else are we missing? A lot of the really – oh, the Renegade Cher- uh, Renegade Compass. Yeah. Those are okay. The Renegade, uh, probably um, the, 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 the Trailhawk is not bad. It's got this fake – 
uh, off-road low range, right, where you hit the low range button. Locks and you into first gear. Locks you into first gear, and, and we did get stuck with it pretty quickly. Um, Seltos, Kia Seltos could be good, but it has a dual clutch. Dual clutch transmission kind of handicaps Most it. of the Mazdas don't have enough ground clearance. Yeah, we just took the CX, we haven't published that video, the CX-9 off-road has an off-road mode. That did pretty well. And it did, pr- were you there for that one? Uh, Nathan did that one. Okay. Um, Land Rover Discovery can be pretty good off road if you equip the right one. Yeah, I mean, out of I mean, Land Rovers are all going to be, you know. Yeah, but the Discovery Sport's not brilliant, and nor, nor is like the Evoque or Velar. Uh, but the not full, enough ground clearance and too much air suspension. The, the full size Range Rovers are pretty darn good. Yeah, off road. Uh, BMW X5 with the off road group is okay. How about the Audi A4 and A6? Those are real traditional. Yeah, the all roads are pretty good. Yeah. yeah, those are pretty good. Not enough ground clearance, but they've got really good um, power and really good all wheel drives. And so is, of course, the Volkswagen Alltrack, which has gone away. Yes, that thing was really cool. Yeah, it did, re- it did really well off road, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so just some, some other ones to keep in mind. So CRV is not very good. Uh, what else isn't very good? Most uh, Escape isn't very good. Most of those cars. The new Bronco, the which will be based on the new Escape Bronco, Bronco Sport, Sport. Yeah. looks like, at least from the spy videos that we've seen. That should be pretty good. That should be pretty good. That might actually be a serious contender for the uh, Jeep, um, either Compass or Cherokee. I think it's aiming for those guys in, in, the, in the highest off-road mode. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that's kind of just a quick rundown. All the Subarus, the, the 8.7-inch ones are going to be about the same. So Crosstrek, Crosstrek is a manual, which is going to help it. It's but available it's a pretty rubbery manual. manual. It doesn't matter off road as long as it <laughs> engages the gear. You're fine. Look, look. Here's the thing, guys. All right, and I'm gonna, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Right? Any pickup truck will be will be better off road than any of these, and it'll be not just a little bit better, but a lot better if it's four wheel drive. That was true five years ago. If it's four wheel drive, no, I disagree. You, you you would rather take you would rather take a Rav Four off road than a Frontier Pro Four X. Is that what you're telling me? No. I would absolutely not. But have you driven the latest Silverados? Yes, we have one. Have you driven? We have the, the entry, Have you driven the entry level four wheel drive Silverado? I have not. You know what they did, right? What they got rid of the low range. Did they really? Completely. You have to spec a Z seventy one or trail bus. All right, all right, that's the exception. Every for every pickup truck with four wheel drive, except for that one, it's going to have a low range. Yes, that's correct. Right. Yep. And, and it'll be better off road. And, yes, and, yep. and, and not, it's not just about the low range. It'll have better tires. It'll have better ground clearance. It'll have better approach angles. It'll be built much more sturdily because it's body on frame, right? So you're not taking unibody off-road. More or less. Yeah, and it'll probably be cheaper. <laughs> it probably will be, right? I mean, these are, you know, I'm looking at Honda Passport, $33,000. You can get a Nissan a Frontier Pro 4X, which is going to be head and shoulders off-road better um, than the Honda Passport, right? Yeah. Or oh, yeah. Yeah. you can take, actually, I was going to say the Honda um, Ridgeline, but it doesn't have a low range. <laughs> yeah, that's not so good. <laughs> I just, it's like I a just, Passport, but heavier. I just argued against my own. But that, that that's kind of its unique thing, right? The, the, the Ridgeline is its own little kind of little bubble. little bubble. Uh, so, well, there you have it, guys. Uh, um, top five soft roaders that aren't Subarus. Uh, and my recommendation is get yourself a pick up truck if you want to spend <laughs> a lot more time off-road. How about you, Tommy? I think that's a great recommendation, yep. All right, and uh, remember, come back to TFL Car or Truck for more news, views, and real-world reviews. And a lot of these things, actually almost all of these that we've talked about, uh, are up on one of our YouTube channels. Uh, we're moving most of our off-road content to TFL Off-Road. Uh, it used to be on TFL Car. We've kind of shifted, and we're starting to put a lot more uh, electric car content on cars. So a lot of this stuff now lives on TFL Off Road. Uh, and the last thing I would say is, uh, if you're listening to this on Monday, the 17th of uh, of um, August. August, then uh, the TRX just came out. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. Yeah, and uh, we've got a complete video of that up on TFL Truck. So uh, for all you truck guys and gals, you're going to want to check that out because the horsepower number uh, just floored us. Yep. See you guys next time. Ciao.